Hello and a very warm welcome to the latest World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinar. Uh, you are very kindly joining us by Zoom um, and as such you'll be able to join in the, um, what, we've got, only got one poll question for you this evening, we've been very kind, um, but if you've joined us before you'll know that we need to just hang fire briefly until we get our friends on Facebook live to join us and then we then we can get started proper. Um, if you have joined us before, well, now, now we've got Facebook Live joining us. So a very warm welcome to the latest World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinar, which this evening is all around worming, but not so much um, on the, some previous webinars we've done about responsible worming and the importance responsible, of responsible worming, but to focus in on a particular area of how, the impact of how, how we worm our horses and what impact that has on the environment. And that is a, a really important issue and very much fits under that banner of responsible worming. Um, if you've joined us before, you'll know that these are interactive to sessions. This evening, I'm delighted to be joined by Claire Shan from Westgate Labs and Dave Rendell, who's current uh, president of the British Equine Veterinary Association at Beaver. And the format for this evening is Claire's going to present to us uh, for about 20 minutes. Then we're going to have a sort of a structured Q&A with uh, Claire and Dave, and then it's very much open to you. So if you're joining us on Facebook Live, please put your questions in the comment section. If you're joining us on Zoom, then please put them in the Q&A function. Every week we get people who put them in the chat function, and it's brilliant for you to chat amongst yourselves in the chat function, but it's much easier for me if you could put the questions in the Q&A function on Zoom. And that's very much over to you. So please, throughout, put your questions in there. And if you're on Zoom, then you have the ability to upvote questions. So if there's a question you really like, rather than having to type it out, you can just upvote it and we'll be able to get through as many questions as we can. If you've joined us before, you'll know that all of our um, webinars um, back to June 2020 are available on our YouTube channel, and we'll put a link up to that. Um, and if you um, are joining us um, for the first time, then you might not know that we run these webinars throughout the winter. Um, so if you do every fortnight, so if you do have a topic that you would like us to, uh, to to focus on in a future webinar, then please do email us at education um, at worldhorsewelfare.org. I think they're most the instructions. Now, obviously, as I say, get back to our topic of this evening, which is all about responsible worming and the and how we can do this in an environmentally responsible and friendly manner. As I say, delighted to be joined by Claire and, um, and Dave. In two weeks' time, our webinar is going to be on promoting positive equine behaviour and well-being through management and delighted that Justine Harrison will be joining us that evening and joined by Justine Vervais. You know, Rosa Vervais, sorry. Um, and uh, I'm away in a couple of weeks. And Sarah Coombs, longtime trustee of World Horse Welfare, but uh, equally importantly, an FEI four star senior international uh, veterinary judge in endurance and eventing, will be in the chair and we'll put um, a link for you to sign up for that. Now, before we get going proper, I'm going to share my screen. Um, th there we go. So that's where we are. Targeted parasite control to take the best care of your horse and the environment. Now, before I introduce Claire, I'm going to um, ask you a question. Uh, ivermectin, which is a very common wormer that many of you will uh, know, um, how um, much ivermectin can be excreted in faeces after deworming? And if you're um, on Facebook, you won't be able to see these, but I'll read out the questions for those uh, um, on Zoom who will be able to see them. Um, is it 0% all of it's absorbed by the horse? Is it less than 50% of the administered dose? 50 to 80% or over 80%? So how much of ivermectin can be excreted after administration? Now, we will come back to that in a second, but whilst you're answering that, I'm going to introduce you to Claire, who um, is um, closely involved through the family uh, and a lifetime of interest in Westgate Labs, uh, which has been a, a, a huge uh, um, pioneer 
um, in providing uh, um, promoting targeted parasite control measures for everyone in the UK since 1999. Now you know we all know the challenges uh, of of worming our horses and how few the challenge of of wormer resistance. And so it is so important that we do respons responsibly uh, worm our horses for their benefit and for the benefit of the environment. And tonight we're very much focusing on that environment piece. So I'm delighted that Claire to be able, uh, able to join us. For those of you who met us last time, you'll know that uh, uh, Claire, um, in the early days, her father was very interested in finding out what the w worm burden of horses were. So when Claire and her sister went round um, uh, to, to shows, their job was to go around picking up poo so they could take it home and dad could have a look and do some fecal egg counting. Um, that must be uh, drawn a few um, uh, expressions of interest at the time. But also now, Claire, the, where Westgate Labs is, is up in Northumberland, and it used to be part of the, uh, the largest hole in Europe because it was an open cast mine. And they have turned that part of the world where the, the Westgate Labs is into an environmental sort of um, tranquility and don't so much to it over the years so if you're ever in Northumberland um, and I, I want a day out then maybe Westgate Labs is a place to go um, so before I hand over to Claire uh, Basil can you give us the uh, response that we've had on the, the poll question please so there you go um, a few uh, seven percent said none of it's absorbed um, but a half, it's not a good even split saying less than 50% of the administered so is, uh, is absorbed or is excreted into the environment, sorry. Um, 50 to 80% is um, a third of you. And then about a fifth of you are saying over 80% of the administered dose. So a good, pretty good split there, uh, which generally means people aren't very sure. So Claire, um, before I'm going to stop sharing my screen, I'm going to hand over to you and you can give us the answer. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for that, Roly, and for the introduction. Dads can be embarrassing, can't they? <laughs> um, but it wasn't for that. Um, silver linings and all, you know, I wouldn't be here championing two of my favourite things, which we're really passionate about. First is horse health and the second is the environment, you know, and we've got both things rolled up and going on and uh, to hopefully do good and, and whatever. So, yeah, the poll question, I was really staggered. Um, to get the answer to this, you know, it's 80 to 98% um, is the amount of ivermectin that can be excreted in feces after giving a chemical, which, you know, that's pretty staggering that that actually then um, is coming out onto our pastures and is toxic um, in either lethal or sublethal amounts to all those invertebrates and also to plants as well. And that's what we're going to go on and look at today. So if I just share my screen and we can jump straight in. Um, we'll get going on this one. Okay. It's always a relief when the technology works, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <you're laughs> yes. good to go. yeah, I think we're good to go on this one. Brilliant. Okay, so yeah, as I said, my name's Claire Shand and I'm the marketing director here at Westgate Labs. This is a subject really close to our hearts. Um, and so really want to look at today, you know, what do we mean? We talk about this sustainable use of chemical wormers a lot, um, but actually let's really under, underpick what does that actually mean? You know, why do we need to limit chemical treatment for our horses? and the environment. Um, I really want to look at dung beetles. They're one of the indicator species in terms of the environment and what's going on in our pastures and our grazing. And then, well, what, how, what do we do about it? How can we best manage the parasite control for our horses and the environment? Because some of those things can seem counterintuitive, um, but actually I think there is a way forward on this. So yeah, this first question really is about sustainable parasite control. And the definition that I really liked was from the UN, which is about meeting the needs of present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And the way that we're currently going on, we're doing really badly to our future selves and to the environment. You know, the hard truth is we're failing on all counts. Um, as you said, we've been doing this for 24 years now and really kind of banging the drum about sustainable parasite control and things are moving but it's still quite slow and then in the environment side of things we're really it's only just coming to light how toxic the worming chemicals that we've got are in our environment what they're doing to our um, microorganisms the invertebrates 
what they do when they get washed into water courses and all these things. And, you know, I'm an avid watcher of the winter watch that's just been on. And we hear an awful lot about how interdependent all of these things are. And it's quite shocking the number of species that are in decline and about how everything is interconnected. And so, you know, nothing's in isolation. And what we do with our horses, what we put in them, how we manage them all has this greater impact um, that we really need to be more aware of. And, you know, it wouldn't be a worming webinar if resistance wasn't the headline news of this, because you know, this is why we really need to act for our horses. Wormer resistance is one of the biggest challenges that's facing horse health currently. We've got so many developments in veterinary medicine, and yet these little ankle biters could be the thing that really cripple us um, from a horse health perspective. So, you know, we've only got five chemicals licensed for horses. They've been around for a long time, um, particularly some of the older ones, the fembendazoles from like the 1960s. And even our newer ones now um, are showing resistance um, growing. So that's going to lead us to untreatable parasite burdens, which from a horse health perspective looks like increasing amounts of colic, anemia, long lasting kind of inhibited growth, those sorts of things. And ultimately, untreatable parasite burdens mean death for horses. And this is on the land as well that it develops. So it means that it compromises the grazing of our horses. You know, we're horse owners here ourselves. The horses are out in the fields. We're poo picking and looking after them daily. And the thought that actually we couldn't go out and do that and that the horses wouldn't be safe to graze that land. Um, and all across, we've got livery yards and competition centers and places where horses have traditionally been kept, the facilities have been developed, and they're all under threat of and our ability to keep horses the way we know um, and that they're happy because of this. So the current situation um, is really not that great. Um, the beaver research from 2018-19 that was presented um, last year is that for every 11 wormers that we give, we only do one worm count. And we know that testing, we can reduce the number of wormers by up to 80%. You know, it, it really helps us to identify who needs treatment and who doesn't. So we're, we're not catching up with this fast enough. You know, we really need to normalize um, sending our horses poo off for analysis and really looking at the, the bigger picture of who needs treatment and when. And what resistance means is that nearly every equine property is going to have resistant parasites because this is a slow build and every time we expose the worms to these chemicals, they have that opportunity. It means we can't just give a wormer and expect it to work. You know, we have to start looking for resistance and that's not something that's commonly done and what we want to help to promote people to do. So targeted parasite control based on testing you know, it's not good enough simply to widen the gaps between wormers because we take a herd of horses like these guys who are they're all kept together um, in the same field the same management we'll find very varying results if we were to worm egg count them all as a herd and generally we'll find that old adage the 80 20 rule 80 percent of the worms being in 20 percent of the horses is true and those are the horses that are going to generally need more support as we go on. So we want to identify these high egg shedders, target them appropriately, and look at what's the right treatment for the horse to target that particular parasite, and also looking at time of year as well, particularly when we're talking about the insisted or the larval stages of that small red worm, which is really common. So yeah, um, blanket treatments really, you know, not a thing anymore, old hat. We need to be looking much more at um, a targeted program. And it's about assessing risk and planning strategically. So rather than being ad hoc in our approach, we really need to be looking at the structure of the herd, how we manage them, what's going on, and doing something appropriately. And there's a series of tests that we really want to promote doing regularly. For a healthy adult horse who is in a low risk situation or medium risk, that looks like a worm egg count being the cornerstone of that. So that's every 12 weeks thinking about that, doing something every season for our red worm and ascarid, addressing the insisted red worm in the late autumn winter, which are those larval ones that can inhibit into the gut wall and a mass emergence can be very dangerous. 
Tapeworm is the other parasite that we're going to need to test for regularly. And again, based on risk and on the parasite life cycle, we suggest doing that every six months. So either spring, autumn or summer, winter. And the other thing that's really being advised now that we need to step up to do is where we do need to give a chemical, let's get those reduction tests in and make sure that those have been effective. So that is very simply, we carry out a worm egg count. It demonstrates that treatment needs to be given. We step in with a wormer and then 10 to 14 days later, another worm egg counts performed. And that's looking at then the percentage reduction and identifying whether we've got chemical resistance present. It's ideal to do that in a herd or a yard, but even do a horse is going to give you some information. The other thing that your prescriber is also going to be wanting to talk to you about is did the horse take the full dose? So if we didn't worm for the weight of the horse or if there was spit out and that didn't go in properly to the horse, then there also could be um, a reason why the worm account was still raised rather than it being a resistance issue. So there's, there's gonna be questions and things to think about in there. And also then we're going on to look at the environment side of things. So we talked about how interrelated everything is and well, you've got a horse out on the grazing land but the parasites are living in the belly of the horse. And they're excreting these worm eggs onto the pasture um, on a daily basis, which are then gonna be infective within that dung that we've got there. Um, it, within four or five days, we're gonna see those starting to hatch, to crawl away from the dung pile and those tiny little motile larvae that you see in that dew drop, climbing those blade of grass and um, hanging out there, waiting, to then be eaten by a horse and for that life cycle to go over again. But of course, the worm eggs go there on the pasture and then into the dung. And the dung is really where our dung beetles, first line of defense, they're in, straight into that pile. But other things as well, like invertebrates, are gonna be hanging out. So I wanted to look at the pathway of wormers getting into soil and, um, so the pink dots here represent this worming chemical, which traditionally we put into the horse as a syringe. And we've already heard by looking at the poll question that 80 to 98% of that is gonna pass straight through the horse um, in a non-metabolized form. So that means that um, it's passing out in its chemical form in the dung. We've got our dung beetles there, the major manure decomposer, and they're gonna be really um, very affected by that but also we've got then that leaching into the soil and affecting things like our earthworms and other invertebrates and plants as well so it's coming to light that um, plants are affected by um, things like ivermectin which is one of our most resilient um, chemicals compounds that get onto the pasture so that can actually restrict root growth up to 30 percent um, Termination, working in a very similar way to the effect that it has on parasites, which is to um, paralyze, again, very limiting um, these animals to perform to their best effect, even if they're not getting the lethal dose. And that also then can be washed off into watercourses, and it's also ecotoxic to aquatic life as well. So lots of unintended consequences by reaching for a worm to try water's burden. So we're going to want to, instead of going for the chemical, look at other ways that we can break the life cycle mechanically rather than relying on these chemicals. So here's me putting my best foot forward, doing some poo picking, but I'm going to go on and talk about that shortly. Definitely we want to be removing those worm eggs from the dung, but we also want to think about dung beetles um, and other critters as well and how we balance that in terms of looking after them as well. Resting and rotating grazing is brilliant because it just gives the opportunity there for um, any of those infective larvae and eggs on the pasture to die off. And if we're talking about small redworm, which are some of our most um, prevalent um, species that we're gonna treat for the worms, if you can rest rotate for three months, brilliant six months even better and a year fantastic and you're going to see the real um, degradation of those and the infection levels on pasture going right down 
If you've got young stock um, and there are ascarids there, which are also a risk, particularly of horses under three or four, but very much of youngsters, they have a sticky outer shell that makes them much more resilient to the environmental um, kind of impacts on them. So they can stay in themselves for 10 years. So we really want to be moving those youngsters around um, to prevent that ascarid infection and lower that on the grazing. Anything you can do to put sheep, goats, chickens, whatever you have across the paddock, that's also going to really help because they will eat the, um, the, the grass with the, those larvae and in, ingest them. And species, the um, worms are generally species specific. So if we're going to make those toast, um, they're not going to go on and survive. It's fantastic. And again, make sure you quarantine and test new horses just to make sure that they're not bringing anything in with them. And all those things will really help. These guys I really wanted to have a look at today. Um, the, the, um, some of our indicator species about how well um, our parasite control and our environmental management is going. And we've seen massive decline in dung beetles over the last few years, and specifically since things like ivermectin and moxidectin wormers, which are very toxic, have emerged. But they do amazing things for our ecosystem. So we really need to look for them better. Um, some dung beetles can fly in up to 10 miles for the right food, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, and you'll see from the pictures here, the activity and the impact. These, um, this dung here um, is just a few days old, and yet by um, tunneling, um, breeding and everything else they do within the dung, they break it down and decompost it much faster than it can um, do anything on its own. And that has a real benefit to the soil health and it brings down nutrients into the soil, it increases the ability for it to take on water, it helps decompaction, um, it uses um, fert as fertilizer and all sorts of benefits for the land itself which um, are estimated to bring the cattle industry 367 million pounds a year, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and these guys are nature's bin men. You know, they want to process this dung. It's what they need to do um, for their lifestyles. And if you think of an average 16 hand horse as producing 18 kilograms of dung a day, that's six and a half tons every year. And if we spend half an hour poo picking daily, that's 182 hours of our time. So you know, these are big numbers that these guys can help us with if we let them. And yet we're seeing this really sad decline. Um, they reckon there's about 60 native species of dung beetles, um, but the four or five of those um, have already been become extinct um, potentially because of the use of wormers and things. So yeah, it's a real big, um, big impact that we need to do something about. And this is the ecotoxicity kind of graph, if you like, um, in terms of which are most dangerous. So you'll see ivermectins and moxidectins right on the left-hand side there as being very, and um, moxidectin moderately toxic. The others are still poison, so they're still gonna have some impact, but they're thought to be moderately less bad, if you like, um, for the environment and when they get into the soil. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't choose the right chemical, the most effective treatment, because the ivermectins and moxidectins are some of our best treatments against small redworm, for example. So we need to still use them to keep our horses healthy, but we also then need to look at the impact of them on our dung beetles, particularly um, because they're very toxic to them. But then also thinking about them in the wider environment to collies. And Ivermectin in particular, the compound, as we've said, is very, very resilient in the environment. So the research shows that if you, the ivermectin goes in the horse, we know a lot of that then is passed out into the feces. And researchers have done other work to show that if that dung isn't collected off the paddock, that that can take, um, so 45 days later, if that's resampled, the concentration of ivermectin will be very, very similar in that pile of dung to when it was first laid. So it's gonna continue to release those toxic chemicals into the environment as it sat there in the paddock if we don't do something about it. Um, so that's why we really need to look at our poo picking and the regime that we do that um, to, to help our dung beetles.
So, for example, on a day to day basis, when you're removing the dung, um, if there's no wormer in the horse, looking at a cycle of doing that every three days. And I'm as guilty as anyone of loving a very clean, spotless paddock and getting a little bit obsessive about going out once or twice a day and getting everything um, collected and then. Um, feeling really good about what that's doing for the um, worming and for my parasite control. However, the dung is also um, the home of our dung beetles. It's what they use and need um, for their habitat and for breeding um, and to support them. So they like fresh dung. So the um, advice now is that we leave the freshest dung if we can. So if you go to remove a pat and you see dung beetles and you like me and you get a little bit excited about that because it's you know all everything regenerating, then that's fantastic. Um, if you can leave that until day three and pick it then, it's gonna still help your parasite control because we know the eggs and the parasites aren't gonna hatch for four or five days but it's also gonna to help to regenerate your dung beetle populations and encourage them um, to regenerate. So it's about balancing those two elements. If we have given a wormer, it's a bit of a different kettle of fish. So we know that, then that the toxins in the, that dung and we meant that getting into the environment as much as possible. So as much as we hate it, um, certainly I do, a restricting turnout is a really good thing um, to do. The research shows that that can be up to 10 days um, that we see the release of that wormer going through the system, particularly with moxidectin, where there is some absorption by the body, and that's going to then um, make that a more slow release chemical. With ivermectin, it's more like four or five days when the peak of that is over. So it's a little bit about how do we look at the chemical we're using and particularly being very diligent with the more toxic ones. If you can only restrict, chemical, uh, restrict turnout for a shorter amount of time, most chemicals reach their highest concentration 24 to 48 hours after they've been administrated. So if you can keep them in just then, that's going to do an awful lot. If you need to put them out, put them in a small paddock where you can poop pick really diligently, making sure that you're doing that every day um, if possible. And the beauty then of doing the targeted worming practices is hopefully there'll be horses that don't need treatment and then we can leave some non-toxic dung for them and they can still have habitat, which is fantastic. Also where possible, worming when dung beetles are less active is also gonna help them out. So between November and February. And I know certainly um, that for our horses and a lot of our customers as well, if they're doing their targeted worming and managing them really well, often you're only gonna give that one treatment if you need it for your insisted red worm in the winter time. So it does work out pretty well in terms of horse care and what they need, as well as balancing those environmental needs. And the other thing we really need to consider then is what do we do with that muck that we've collected that we know has those chemicals in it um, from the worming chemicals? The good news is that the dung beetles don't tend to breed in muck heaps. So they might be interested in it, but it's actually not something that's gonna be of um, particular um, habitat they're gonna dwell in anyway, which is brilliant. Ivermectin, which is one of the most resilient chemicals to break down from our wormers, will actually compost if we put it in a muck heap and it gets thermophilic. So that's when it gets above 60 degrees centigrade. Within a few weeks, actually, the research says that that's gonna have broken down Moxidectin, which is the next toxic one, actually is much more um, able to break down even in the environment. So that can compost at um, normal temperatures rather than needing to be that high. So it's really that ivermectin we're targeting, particularly with our muck heaps and getting that steam going. And then really the location of those is also key because what we don't want is any runoff to go into the rivers, um, drainage or anything like that. So if you can uh, site them more than 10 meters away from a water course. Be really careful about um, any field drainage, standing water, things like that, are all gonna aid contamination and this leaking into the environment. So we wanna be very careful about that element of it as well. Um, and some of the research suggests that if you can put a roof over it to reduce that runoff, 
um, that will also be beneficial, or even just a tarp for that particular um, uh, muck heap which has got the infected dung in it. Um, and when siting a muck heap, um, also just be a little bit careful about um, parasite reinfection. So, for example, we know that the small redworm larvae can have up to three meters away from their pile of dung, pretty much motile for very tiny organisms. So what we would hate you to do is to all that good work of poo picking and then um, them transgressing back into the field and undoing all your hard work. And if you've got a tapeworm infection, that can be even more um, motile because they're obviously they have a tiny little grass and mite which um, becomes infected and then that has an even greater reach away from your muck heap so just something to be aware of and keep your hard work um, doing what it should be doing and then when we're, if you are ever looking at muck spreading that back on the field I know fertilizers are so expensive and you know that is good organic matter would leave it for at least six months if you can, which not only then will see the worming chemicals breaking down, but it will also then help those parasite eggs to have degraded sufficiently so you're not then reinfecting your pasture and making that a risk as well. Um, so some just really nice topics there. Um, so all this really is looking at buying time um, for the future. What we really need to be doing is minimising the chemicals that we're putting into our horses. And there are lots of things coming on board to help support that. So hopefully a saliva test for the insisted small redworm um, is in development or will be launched soon. We're also potentially looking at refinement of worm use. So we know that currently um, the advice certainly that we follow from the Modern Research Institute and Liverpool University sets a certain level over which we're going to step in with the chemical. And I think as that um, time goes on and we have more information about this, we could for lower risk horses see that um, going up and um, leaving horses untreated for longer. There's also, while there's no new chemicals in development, um, there are alternative treatments being looked into. So things like biological solutions, tannins and fungi that can potentially look um, at reducing worm burden. Things like um, sanfoin is a feed um, type that's been used um, traditionally for many hundreds of years and thought to have parasite control. But for, in terms of treating worms, um, treating worms, we really need to look at licensing which is very very expensive as well as how do you package the product for commercial sale and how, how do you make palatable um, treatment then that um, horses can take and I think there's going to be much more coming out on the management so the research and the um, development that's gone into um, or going into the environmental side of things and how we manage our horses is only going to grow as we shine a spotlight on this side of things as well. Um, and I just popped a little canter logo up there as a little seed for something that is coming because um, traditionally there's been quite a confusing messages around worming and things have moved um, kind of changed I guess as we've gone along and, and learned more about this parasite control which can make it a bit of a confusing um, landscape for people to navigate for their horse health. So Cantor is really bringing everybody together, a pan-industry group of people, um, to look at parasite control and how we manage this, this for our horses and tackle what is such a really big issue coming up. So um, that will be launching in March um, and so just watch out for that coming too and some, with them um, lots more developments for helping research and development on horse worming and advice. So really, um, what I really want you to, guys to take away is the strategic thinking to look at not just our own horse's health, but really the bigger picture. So really to look at the other horses in our field um, and, and in and around us, we're looking at our dung beetles. What do we do to conserve them and to help to do that, those populations to recover? The environment, um, this is some new tree planting out on our nature reserve, because this is about really the bigger picture. And it's about doing the best by the horses in our futures. So if we're going to be able to keep horses and have new um, animals growing on in the future, we really need to be starting to think about that. So my challenge is what will we do when the worm has stopped working? Let's not wait to find out before we act. And if it's time to worm, think worm count first, 
but also let's look after those dung beetles and our environment too. Blair, thank you so much. That's brilliant and given us lots to think about. Some very sort of consistent themes coming through there. So, um, and which will be great to be able to pick up on. Now, but, but before we get into the structured QA, I'm just going to share my screen again. And um, it gives me great pleasure to who's joining Claire for our um, QA now is Dave Rendell. I think, Dave, this is your first appearance on, is it it's your first appearance on one of our webinars? Um, we, 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 we've saved the best till very late in the day. Uh, but uh, no, Dave is current president of the British Equine Veterinary Association um, and has been, is a, is a extremely experienced um, is a medicine specialist, internal medicine specialist. Um, and is very, and I think the whole issue around the challenges with worming, the challenges with wormers, is something that I think it's very fair to say is, is very dear to, to David's heart in terms of trying to drive, or Dave's heart, to try and drive through changes, as Claire has so eloquently talked about. And it is the fact that all of us, as, as um, equine owners, we really do need to change our behaviour or get more of us to change our behaviour along the lines that Claire's talked about. David's worked um, throughout the UK, including at Liphook um, down south and Rainbow Equine up north. Now he's back down south in the southwest as um, involved in a number of projects, including being president of the British Equine Veterinary Association and running his family farm or helping manage his family farm um, where he does have sheep. And I think he's just finished lambing. Um, and when I asked Dave for a quirky fact, he said, I, I don't have any quirky facts, but he didn't did let me know that he scored a try at Sandy Park. And for those of you who might not know, Sandy Park is where Exeter ply their rugby in the Premiership, the English Premiership. Very impressive team. Less impressive when he told me it was in Zorg Wall on New Year's Day last year. But nevertheless, all tries counts. So, uh, Dave, it's brilliant to have you uh, with us this evening. Um, and um, David, I'll come to you first. I mean, uh, you know, something you hear so often and what Claire has talked about, um, and obviously some people, I hope not many, but some people still might be routinely worming their horses because a, a number of years ago, that's what people did. But uh, when you ask them, when you talk to people about why they don't change and, and, and take a more the approach that uh, Claire has talked about, they say, well, it's more expensive, isn't it? Where, where, where is the expense in responsibling worm, responsibling, worming responsibly and, you know, taking a more sort of lax approach that in hindsight was what we did previously? Um, yeah, very good question. Thank you. It's interesting. I've just I've just come out of a project this afternoon where we were reviewing questionnaires on what what the barriers were for owners not engaging in in diagnostic led deworming. Um, and interestingly, it seemed that cost was quite a big factor for the individual horse owner, but for the for the bigger stud properties, it didn't seem to be such a big a big issue. But you're right for the individual owner, it does seem to be a barrier. And un unfortunately, this is like most of this topic um, around lack of education, unfortunately, or, or lack of lack of us achieving getting the message through. I think lots of us have been trying to educate, but it's quite hard to get those messages. Often we do webinars like this and we potentially talk to the people that are already interested. It's hard to reach the wider community. But in answer to your question, it's actually cheaper to do diagnostic led deworming um there there was a really nice study in the veterinary record a few years ago which compared a traditional interval approach with the cost of doing regular fecal worm egg counts and the fecal worm egg count approach was cheaper there is obviously a cost to doing the diagnostic testing and i think that's what pe puts people off because they perceive that they're going to do the diagnostic testing and then they're going to have to worm as well uh, and then therefore it is going to cost more money but if they are doing the diagnostic testing uh, regularly, they will end up using far, far less dewormer, 80% less dewormer. So they might use two wormers where they previously used 10. So there is a massive saving there on the dewormer cost and obviously therefore a huge environmental benefit as Claire has already outlined. 
Um, so it really is cheaper to adopt a diagnostic-led uh, approach. It can become a little bit more expensive if we start doing blood and saliva tests. And I think this is where it's really important to speak to a, the vet that knows your property about exactly what the management is on your property to target that testing as accurately as possible. Um, because there is a balance between doing all the testing and coming up with a protocol that is appropriate for your property and also affordable on your property um, and every single property is diff different and it, it, it's quite hard because we're always asked well what's the what's the best plan for deworming and there isn't a single best plan it totally depends on your management the kinds of horses you've got the movements on and off what's happening with other horses on the yard um, there are so many variables so it, it really is worth having a plan an annual plan ideally that's reviewed annually to look at what is going on on your property and then you can make some really good decisions then about what testing you do and what strategic treatments potentially you might still need to do um, but if you do engage in a, a proactive approach like that you will you will save money um, so a very long-winded way of saying we just need to get that message through to people and make them realize that not only are they doing the right thing but it will also be cheaper so it's quite a powerful message, isn't it? I mean, clearly, there's there's a huge issue with wormer resistance. There's a huge issue, um, as Claire's talked about, the environmental, you know, consequences of us overworming our horses. Um, and actually, you know, taking a diagnostic leg approach is, is cheaper in the long run. It seems a a win-win-win situation. But one of the things, Claire, Dave talked about there was the, the, the vet would know your property and engaging with the vet about discussing it with your properties. You, but Or your property, sorry. But yet over 50% of our horses are kept in livery yards or on yards. And obviously that makes it more challenging. So how can horse owners and yard owners and yard managers with multiple horses to factor in how can they um streamline or simplify or help manage um the worm egg count process yeah it's a really key one because i think it is too easy to just get a wormer and give it whereas actually the collection of the sampling is one of the most difficult areas of it because it's just it's difficult and it's change you know getting across from giving a wormer to then having to collect the samples and send them off and all that interpretation and what happens there, it can be perceived as fairly difficult. But I think if one person on a yard can take control of that, hopefully the yard manager, much better that everyone is on the same plan, that it's managed, that it's taken into account from a central source. And then you can give really good advice that's going to support that whole yard. Because as we looked, everything's in to connect up, you know, horses are all living together, sharing that parasite burden that's on the pasture. So yeah, really that's the key. And I think in terms of then the feces collection, the sampling, a lot of the time um, we get people's success with um, insisting that the horses stay in for a night, for example, um, before testing, which means that they can then be picked up from the stable, fresh in the morning, be packed up and go off to the lab, which is really straightforward. Um, or if you've got individuals that you trust, if they're getting the samples for their own horses, they can then spend that time to ensure. But um, it can sometimes be tricky, but the payoff and the dividends are many. So we'd really encourage people to make that switch. It's often not as difficult as people perceive. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Really, sorry. Can I, sorry yeah, can I, there, was, there was some work recently, again, that was looking at attitudes towards this. And a lot of livery yard owners were actually concerned about losing liveries if they implemented plans. Now, there are loads and loads of liveries that livery yards that do already have the kind of plans that we've talked about, which is fantastic. But um, it is disappointing that some are potentially put off by the idea of losing owners. You would hope that actually it would be a positive thing that um, people would want to go to yards where they are working in a more sustainable way and they're reducing antalmintic or dewormer use. But I, I really think the livery yard owners need to put their foot down over this because ultimately it's their livelihood that's at stake. And if 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 it's their livery yard and they have multi-resistant parasites, and there wouldn't be a livery yard in the country, I suspect, that hasn't got some degree of antalmintic dewormer resistance. But if they start to get resistance to multiple classes, which is not that far away, none of us think, then Effect, effectively you're not going to have a business because you're not going to be able to graze horses there and control parasites on the property and we've seen this in in sheep already 
Um, and I often get accused of being a doom monger when I say this, but I was interested in, that Claire was adopting the same message earlier on, saying that ultimately horses will die and become chronically diseased if we can't effectively treat their parasites. So if you want to run a livery yard on your property long term, you, you need to take control of it. Um, and you, you need to put your foot down and, and make sure that owners are adopting a targeted strategy and you need to be the one that's controlling that. A again, I would engage the vet or suitably qualified person to put a program together for you for the for the year. If it's a mixed ownership livery yard, it's even more important. There, It's even more complicated. So essentially hide behind another professional or put the onus on them if you don't want to be having the difficult conversations necessarily uh if it's professional advice that that's what you've got to do then you've got something to to hide behind but but yeah i think yard owners have got to take responsibility for themselves brilliant and D dave just picking up on that then and just focus still on the yard uh issue I mean, obviously if there's multiple horse owners then um you uh, you potentially will have multiple vets that, that those horse owners use or multiple suitably qualified persons um how any advice of how you can better um sort of get coordination there well, there's certain there's far far more to be gained in terms of reducing the use of dewormers financial savings environmental benefits if everyone is singing to the same hymn sheet and working to the same plan if different people are working to different plans doing different stuff it completely undermines the whole thing so i would i would say the delivery yard owner needs to to work with a vet that they normally work with and the other vets who work for individual horse owners on the yard have to get have to get in behind that and respect that and everyone has to work together on it and i don't i don't think that's an issue that happens a lot in practice um this isn't an area that vets are typically territorial over uh if they are over anything so i, I think the livery yard owner essentially has to has to bring bring, every, bring everyone together and all work to the same plan that that one vet or sqp has has developed yeah um claire then i mean you talked you really well about biodiversity i mean how can owners um promote sort of pasture health in a sustainable manner i mean you picked up on this uh, uh, in your presentation but what what are the key issues there I think it's really appreciating that you can't make big changes overnight. So these things all take time and will also be influenced by the other things that are going on in the farms around you and their use of chemicals too. But I think it's a bit of a slow burn. So we've got to do what we can with what we have. And if that is then putting in pl pl place these ways of stopping the chemicals getting into the environment and starting to slowly build up these dung beetles being the indicator species but you'll also be doing so much for the worms for the other invertebrates the mites everything else that are in and on that grassland so yeah just keep an eye when you're poo picking and if you're seeing an increase then you're doing the right thing and you know that's good work that's building brilliant and it's it's great to see so many people here tonight and we, we well today because um it's in the afternoon we've got a lot of people from uh central america latin america from brazil from costa rica from, lots from colombia which is brilliant or from the us uh but also from across the uk from scotland wales uh and england so it's it's, it's brilliant to have so many of, of you with us tonight um so next i'm going to come to dave i mean we've talked about um and claire has touched on this and you've just touched on it but i think it's it's significant enough to sort of just to, to focus in on again what, what what other health issues are we likely to see in horses with a moderate to severe to severe worm burden depends a little bit on which kind of worm we're talking about um lack of weight gain into weight loss just lethargy just poor doing um colic potentially anemia um, unfortunately, with some of these parasites, like the, the large strong gars, which are not a focus currently, um, often the first thing we see is a surgical colic. Uh, with cytostomins, which we do see an awful lot of, the small red worms, small round ones, regrettably, and I've, I've dealt with dozens of them in my time, unfortunately, the first sign you often see is just profound diarrhea and a, an incredibly sick horse. You don't often get, we don't always get chronic disease in the lead up you sometimes the first sign you see is is a terminal one essentially and it's already too late to do much about it so um yeah there, there are some some really quite tough stories out there unfortunately because these parasites do sneak up on us yeah 
Um, just looking at what the, a few comments, uh, Susan talks about our vets have a monthly plan that includes quarterly worm egg counts and annual tape, tape wormer, amongst other things. So that it's, you know, it really is, people are doing it. And, and, and Claire, Claire is all, someone, call Claire, the knock on effect on invertebrates and insects then also impacts the breeding of wading birds such as lapwing and curlew, which then continues to knock on up the food chain. So, I mean, that, that's obviously is very relevant. It's not just on the on the yard that, that it's going to, this the environmental contamination is going to be felt, is it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the curlew are one of the most emphatic birds. You know, we hear the calls here, that's just so evocative and absolutely beautiful to hear them and to have the loss of those species from our countryside. You know, they're in massive decline and this is only going to hit them harder. You know, all sides, things like poaching and um, farming practices and hunting and everything else. So, yeah, if we can do what we can, then that's going to help to hopefully preserve them in our countryside. Brilliant. Um, and thank you for everyone who submitted questions. We're going to get on to them in a second. Just remember, if uh, you're on Facebook, put them in the comments function and we'll transfer them across. And if you're on Zoom, put them in the Q&A function. But there's some really good questions in there. So if you like them, then do upvote those questions as well. Um, so final question for you both. And, and I suppose it's I, just uh, if anyone is not sitting up and taking notice, uh, then hopefully after these two answers, they will do. But if resistance to deworming drugs is not controlled, what may be the long term consequences be and what's the long what's being done to tackle the issue? So um, uh, if I if I could, I'll come to you both, but maybe Claire, what, what what from your perspective, what's the long term consequences if we don't get this under control? Well, I think as we've already stressed, it's, a, it's horse health is the biggest impact in our ability to keep horses on our land that we've horses on now so you know it's really going to compromise and have a very big impact on our ability to do that and um, which would be really sad and you know as Dave said it's affected sheep we've seen it in other species let's learn from that and take action before we get there and hopefully by time that means that um, something else will come along to help us while we do what we can to be real sustainable on our use of wormers. I know, and I just love Leon's messages just now saying he was only getting half of what we say, um, but he's now kicked the kids off the internet and now he's hearing everything, which is marvellous. So bad luck, kids, but well done, Leon. Um, Dave, for you, what's where where are we going if we don't get this under better control? So I think the most horses will adapt. They, we all have a natural immunity to parasites, but the reality is to allow that to happen, we would have to manage horses a lot more extensively we would not be able to keep them in the numbers that we keep them in the small areas that we keep them in. They we would have to go back to a much, much more extensive way of keeping horses, um, which wouldn't be viable for most equine businesses. And we would have to accept that some wouldn't develop enough immunity and they, they would succumb to, to disease and death as a consequence of, of parasites, unfortunately. So it is, it's serious um, on a number of different levels. Um, Claire, you mentioned in terms of what's being done about it, and obviously the work of Beaver, uh, the work of veterinary surgeons and SQPs across the country, the work of Westgate, th there's a lot of activity going on. But you mentioned Canter. Um, what, what, what's that all about? Yeah, it's something that's really exciting. Um, there's been developments in sheep and cattle along similar lines. So you might have heard of scops and cows, um, which is um, sustainable control of parasites in sheep. And it's the similar, um, the real catalyst has come from the veterinary medicines directorate who have, um, they're really getting on board that this is such a serious topic that we need to do something about it. And so they have convened this pan industry working group, which is um, made up of vets, parasitologists, specialists, it's the pharmaceutical companies, diagnostic labs, it's welfare, horse owners, yard owners, and really to bring everybody together into the same room to look at what we need to do to instigate this behaviour change and um, also to invest in more research and um, to look at, well, what are the barriers to people taking part and how do we make a difference? So it's the first time anything like this has happened um, for certainly equine parasite control. And I think it's fantastic because it's really going to help give us this best practice guidelines that everybody then is singing off the same hymn sheet. You know, we're always trying to keep up with the most recent research and advice and help people to navigate that in a practical way with their horses. But actually, this is just going to give us that leg up that we really need for this. Brilliant. 
And Dave, obviously, I know through your time at Beaver, you, you've been pushing hard to try and, and promote a more, more responsible approach to worming. What, 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 what initiatives are you involved in at the moment? Uh, well, Canter, which we've just talked about. Um, there is a cross veterinary um, research project that's just coming to a conclusion, uh, Project Worms, which was instigated by um, vet partners and Tim Mayer from the CVS group. So we're just pulling all that together. Um, we've got our own Beaver and Telmintic uh, working group. Um, yeah, uh, and other little projects as well, but they're the, they're the main ones. And simplistically, Dave, I mean, th th there's five drugs, many of which have got significant resistance issues. Why aren't more drugs being developed? Uh, sadly, because the equine market is small and it's not a very appealing prospect for, for big pharma, um, the big pharmaceutical companies. The amount of research that is required to bring products to market is, is huge. Um, it's therefore very costly and the returns aren't there because... Um, although we, it feels like we sell a lot of dewormer and we sell far, far more than we should do, um, that isn't really big, a big enough uh, reward for the pharmaceutical companies to invest in it when they can see far, far bigger rewards from investing in other in other spheres, unfortunately. So, the, I mean, from what you see, the reality is the wormers of, that we've got are the wormers we've got. We ain't going to be getting anything new anytime soon. Obviously, Claire did talk about alternative treatments, but in terms of d d uh, licensed drugs for treating wormers, d d d there's nothing in no, no prospect of anything new coming to the market. Um, brilliant. Listen, thank you for that. So now um, we've got plenty of questions. So let's kick on uh, with Simone's question up first. Um, and Claire, Simone's asked, would you still advocate harrowing the pasture? No, sadly not. Not in this country anyway. Just our climate isn't suitable. We just get such a dew in the morning, even on our warm summer days, that actually just there's not enough to desiccate and dry out the dung, which is what you're really trying to achieve by harrowing. So in this country, instead, we simply end up spreading the infection wider around the field. So horses will usually graze lawns and then have dung like pile areas latrine areas of the field and you're simply then spreading that through everything and doing the parasites a, a good job um so they can reinfect our horses more easily so sadly not unfortunately and you know just to ride into that i mean obviously the summer we had last summer this is from a uk perspective i should haste and say you know it was uh, you know in, th in those conditions i mean any different or would you still not recommend harrowing potentially um but we did also see higher worm accounts which is not what we expected you know when it is really um, very hot like that and that could potentially be horses grazing closer to the ground and um, to the soil or having to graze closer to piles of dung than they normally would because there's less grass on you know to be had on the field so we're not really sure about that um, but I would still say we guard against it unless you're going to rest the field for a um, significant amount of time after you have harrowed. Uh, in asking that rider, I'm very aware that we've got an international audience and that the, the people in Colombia are harassing, saying they don't know what hot weather is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there is there is, an, there is another small point there. Harrow, I totally agree with Claire. Harrowing is a complete no-no for parasite control. There was also one study a while ago that showed it increased the risk of grass sickness, which not a common disease, but another good reason not to harrow. Very good point. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, Dave, Charlotte has asked, if your paddock is surrounded by mature hedge hedges, is it OK to poo pick the paddock and then dispose of the poo under the hedge so it's away from the grass but still available for the dung beetles? It's a lovely idea, isn't it? We don't really know how far the parasites actually migrate on the pasture. People pluck figures out the air, but we don't really know. So um, you want a pretty decent buff. I've heard figures of five meters, 10 meters, 20 meters. The reality is nobody knows. But I would I would say, unless you're gonna have a very, very big field margin, it's probably not a good option. Yeah, and I assume that, that you would agree with that, Claire, wouldn't you? From what, from I would what you do, said, yeah, right? unfortunately. Um, so Kate has asked, what is your knowledge, thoughts on feeding, God, can I pronounce that right, diatomaceous earth to horses as a natural form of wormer? Uh, Claire, are you, got any thoughts on that? 
I mean, people do use different herbs and um, supplements to help support um, the gut and to make them as they um, are kind of promoted to be more resilient um, to worms. I think if you're going to follow that sort of regime, really would urge you to do regular testing and make sure that you've got that in place to highlight any issues and don't be afraid to step in with a camel when you need to. Um, so, I, you know, if you want to support that way, it works for some people, but definitely keep up your testing. And just, yeah, OK, because you talked about alternative therapies in one of your slides. Um, is it, are, are, is there any research backing up any of that kind of uh, or, or a significant experience backing up the, the effectiveness of those alternative options? They're not licensed. So from that aspect, we can't prescribe them. Um, I guess it's personal choice, really, to support with those. Um, but yeah, do your testing. Yeah. So there are there are there are some some good studies on nematodes and, and fungal um, agents for tackling um parasites but the evidence for their use in in the field situation is a bit lacking so it's a, it's hard to draw robust conclusions about how effective they are so i totally agree with claire that if you are going to use those sorts of products you re you really do need to be testing to make sure that they're having the effect you hope they are um other herbal products there are some worm um deterrent products i don't understand how they work do they do they give the horse bad breath and all the worms run away i i, I don't follow the logic to some of those products so um yeah, yeah, I, I agree with Claire. You, you've got to follow it up with testing. But there's yeah. some, some, some of the, some of the, the, some of the newer um, fungal agents and so forth, not widely available in, this, in the UK, but they could be quite exciting if we get some decent data to show they work in the field. And, and Dave, just a, a, a sort of a, a sorry, Claire, were you going to come in then? No, no, I was just saying I, I agree. You know, it's exciting to hear of new things coming on, but until they're licensed, we can't prescribe them. But I think, yeah, um, let's watch and wait and see um so dave I, I i'm a good horse owner and as a result of tonight tomorrow i'm going to go and pick up some horse poo um how, how do i count the eggs in the horse poo uh it's probably best you don't really um, <laughs> <laughs> um i think that is one of the that is one of the concerns around um diagnostic testing is is lots of people do have a go at it and there is no regulation of it um so i would i would collect your sample um there are lots of guidelines out there from vets from westgate from other providers um collect your sample you want to take a bit of poo from a few different piles you want to make sure it's kept cool you want to send it to the diagnostic lab fairly quickly um particularly um when the weather is warmer and, and eggs start to hatch fairly quickly um and you want to yeah you want to send it to a reptile provider to to give you a result and ideally you don't just want to sample one horse it's fine if you've only got one horse but you want to sample as many horses in the group as possible to to give you the best idea of what's going on um to build up a picture for the for the herd and i bounce of this stuff claire so i was just going to add into that yeah when you're taking your sample give enough um we do get people stingy with horse poo you know they, which is fairly surprising but also then to exclude the air gap so when you're putting that in the pot that will also help to preserve the efficacy of that um along the way in transit but i've also i've also been sent half a carrier bag we don't need that much either just the, <laughs> about and it, particularly if the lamp's paying for the postage they get quite cross um but just um just a ping pong ball size is what i've always said i don't know what claire thinks but um Preferably yeah. from a few different places in the in the pat. Yes. Brilliant. Um, Claire, Rebecca on Facebook has asked, how does Decamax injection for leg mites affect the environment? Well, it's a subcutaneous injection. David will probably have a um, better idea of this, but it's so it will be slow released um, into the environment. So through the horse, I'm not sure of research that's been done on it, but you know, you're still putting ivermectin within the horse. I don't know about the excretion rates of that because that obviously will be metabolized in a different way. Probably more a Dave question. Have you got any insight? We don't. I think the honest answer is we don't know. Well, that information is not in the public domain, to my knowledge. There probably was some work done when it was originally registered, but I'm not familiar with it um, and probably wouldn't be able to get hold of it. Um, but intuitively, um, from first principles, like you say, it'll be metabolized via the liver. Um, and some of it may be excreted into the gut, but it's going to be at much, much lower levels than oral ivermectin. And I have to say, 
it it is something that makes you think that maybe injectable options might be the way we go in the future but that's a kind of worms poor expression we probably don't want to open at the moment because none of those projects would be would be registered or they're not registered at this stage but um it would be we're pretty confident it's effective for internal parasites as well as external parasites and it probably does have less impact on the environment but we we couldn't be advocating its use because we just don't have the data brilliant thank you um now, Leon's asked a question, Leon, who uh, has children who are very unhappy at the moment, um, but Leon is grazing with, we are grazing with sheep in a fluke area. Do any current horse wormers worm for fluke? Dave? Uh, no, I think, I, I do think we need to consider the risk of fluke, but I think the risk of fluke is often overstated in horses. It does affect horses, it does affect donkeys, um, but uh, I, I hate the idea of people routinely treating for fluke because the, it's incredibly rare for us actually to see to see disease. But again, if you are grazing with um, sheep and cattle that you know have fluke or you're in a fluke area, then you'd want to speak to your vets because they can they can test for exposure. They can test for indicators of fluke related disease. But please, please don't think you should be going out treating everything for fluke because you would have to get a separate d d or anti-parasiticide to do that and it would just be another thing that's going out into the environment that's probably unnecessary brilliant um thank you dave um we've got a question from normal on facebook uh claire what should you do with manure after worming to make it safe now you did pick up on this in your presentation but it'd be great if you could just reiterate that yeah sure well take it off the pasture if the horses are grazing. So be really diligent with your poo picking, particularly for the first few days. And um, we know that the peak excretion is usually between 24 to 48 hours after. If you can keep them in in that time, that's even better. And then put that on a muck heap. And we really want to be looking using ivermectin, which is, we know is very resilient, get that composted at high temperatures. So really look for a steaming muck pile and have that in for a few, good few weeks, which is gonna help to break those compounds down. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Lisa on Facebook, Dave, has, has asked, how long does a field need to be rested to get help getting rid of worms? Oh, there's no easy answer to that question. It's very, very variable, primarily uh, according to climate. Um, I, th I think it's a, a mistake to think that over the winter, the frost kills a lot of these parasites. We don't, we don't think it does. A lot of parasites are overwintering quite successfully. Um, interesting to hear what Claire was saying earlier about the really hot weather last year being associated with high worm egg counts because we would typically think that actually that hot dry weather would be the best way of getting rid of parasites that would be the best way to to break the cycle um so we just we just don't know a matter of months for some of the parasites but potentially eggs of some of the ascarid species can survive for years um which obviously is a real problem and so they tend to be excreted a lot more by foals so if you if you've got foals then potentially the amount of time and also the amount of time you've got to um put your muck aside is 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 increased quite dramatically brilliant um claire again you touched on this but it'd be great if you could just reiterate it patricia's asked would swap swapping sheep and horses between grazing fields cause the larva to die off when ingested by the sheep and but and would it be safe for the sheep if they ingest larva uh, uh, but from the horse pastures yeah, most of the parasites we have are species specific. There's just a couple of more unusual tapeworms that go between the two. So yeah, absolutely. If the sheep ingest the larvae from um, the horse worms, it will kill the larvae, but it won't have any negative impact on the sheep and vice versa. Brilliant. Um, so that's, um, so we've got a question from on Tracy on Facebook. As Dave, as the weather becomes warmer because of global warming, will there still be an insisted stage? Uh, yeah, almost certainly. Yeah. Because that is not impacted by the, the outside temperature. Uh, it, no, it's an integral part of the parasite life cycle. It's not necessarily strictly related to to season i think there is a, there is a degree of seasonality to it but it, it it's not make or break they will they will still insist brilliant thank you for that um claire um claire has asked uh would the ideal be to poop at your horse's field every three days um because i think you know we we're often told to poop it every day if you can but certainly every other day but we didn't really consider the dung beetle in in that 
you talked about every three days. Is that is that the right cycle? And is that for all year? Yeah, from a parasite control perspective, they reckon twice a week is going to be sufficient in order to get the dung from the pasture and then um, before they hatch. And I think if you're then looking at that with your dung beetles um, in mind as well, that's going to give them some habitat too. So, yeah, I think that would be a good plan. Brilliant. OK, thank you for that. Um, Dave Mells asked, when I poo pick in the summer, there are thousands of small beetles at the bottom of the wheelbarrow and underneath the poos. These beetles are about the size of Tic Tac mints and brown in colour. Can you tell me the name of them? Thank you for the fab webinar. So uh, I, uh, how good are you uh, at differentiating the different species of dung beetle? Uh, pretty poor. <laughs> Pretty poor. Cool. I can tell that there are different ones in our piles of feces at home, but I can't name them, I'm afraid. But it, 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 I assume the beetles of tic tac size, uh, mint size, I mean, they, they, that, that's quite small, isn't it? Uh, the dung beetles that I would be familiar with would be considerably smaller, but bigger than that, Claire. Yeah, well, we have dwellers and tunnelers in this country. There's about 60 different species of them. We don't have the rollers that you'd like see on an African plain. They um, are quite kind of iconic. Um, so, yeah, lots of different sorts and sizes and types. Um, I couldn't name them, I'm afraid, um, but I'm sure someone, um, well, an entomologist, Dr. Sarah Bainon from the Bug Farm would um, absolutely be able to. And if you get down there, fantastic resource in St. David's in Wales, which um, they've got this amazing place, which is promoting sustainable worming practices and, um, and care of dung beetles and pasture land and the environment, but also then um, showcasing different beetles around the world as well. So they're amazing. Yeah, and Claire has said Bug Life has, uh, has some great um, resources. Um, I, I love that you said dwellers and tunnelers. I can imagine mm. what a tunneler does. What does a dweller do? Yeah, just kind of um, is in amongst it. So they will eat it and um, breed in it and you know do what they do, I guess, before they fly out to find their next fresh dung pile. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Dave, Charlotte's asked, when thinking about resting and rotating paddocks, is there any potential difference in timescales if you're using a track system rather than traditional grazing paddocks? Oh, good question. I think it all depends on the grazing intensity, really, rather than the system itself. Um, but, but, yes, and Erin said it's a great question. So th that you think that would be the more relevant thing? I think yeah, it's how, how many horses are are on the area rather than rather than the style of of grazing. And I think some track systems have very little grazing. You know, they they roll it right down to mud or these surface areas, so they're going to be less grazing on there anyway. Um, whereas some are fully grass, and then that's a bit different. And I suppose by by egg counting, you're going to be able to find out what by by testing. You know, you're going to be able to find out what what what. Yeah, come on. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, Kate's asked, am I right in thinking that it is the eggs that horses pick up off pasture rather than the adult worms? She's, so that's the first part of the question. Is that, um, Dave, do you want to take that one? Well, the egg, yeah, the eggs hatch into larvae, which migrate up the grass, um, and then the grass gets eaten and the larvae get ingested. And there's a number of different, right. there's a number of different stages, the larval, no, stages of larvae in the life cycle um, as they mature within the horse then. So she said, do they shed live adult worms in their poo? No, they obviously shed the eggs, which then turn into... To, to, um, how long do they survive? In fact, I've lost that question because she, she asked about uh, quite a few questions. And let's see if I can find it again. Um, how long do they uh, would they survive on the pasture? That comes back to what we were talking about earlier. It really depends on climate. Um, it's really, really variable. Um weeks into months into years for some species. Yeah, and particularly and tapeworm where you've got the infective egg in the tapeworm, which then is running around on the pasture. And um, it's very much more inclusive of environmental conditions, like, you know, heat, moisture, all has an impact too. And, and the final bit of Kate's bit is the fact that she poo picks her field, but her neighboring livery in the adjacent pack and paddock doesn't. So could the, the build up of poo over the fence impact her horses? Yeah, potentially. She needs to, she needs to needs to dob her into the livery yard owner who needs to put a foot down like we spoke about earlier. Well, I definitely. Suppose, yeah, or I suppose at least try and have a discussion with her in the first instance, and then if that. Oh, yeah, yeah, much more professional option, really. Yeah. 
Um, I, I, I don't know what would I know about that. Um, Bruce. Yeah, no, well, and that comes that comes back what to what we were saying earlier about everyone everyone having to pull together to get maximum benefit. She will still be deriving a lot of benefit from what she's doing. But if everybody on the property is work pulling in the same direction, everyone is going to gain far more and save more money. Um, Claire, Charlotte's asked, the thought with livestock now is not to move them to clean pasture after treatment. So why stable horses after worming? Yeah, the stabling after worming is really to do with the chemical um, and the, that's in the, the dung that's going to then contaminate the environment. So yeah, I absolutely agree that if you worm a horse and you move it straight to fresh pasture, that that's going to breed for a um, population of more resistant worms because you basically take out all the susceptible worms, you move to fresh pasture, and then there is the space for the ones that haven't been susceptible to the worms. So they have resistance to then breed and those to grow on. So it is thought that it's better to put the horse back on its original pasture because they're always going to be picking up these larvae and then they get this much more um, representative population in the horse of some susceptible and the, you know, the, the resistant worms that are there as well. So, yeah, I agree with that. And um, the steps that we're talking about are really about the ecotoxicity and how we minimise that. Got you. I, I, I totally agree with what Claire's saying. There, there is sometimes a balance if you've got properties where you do need to control parasite numbers. Um, but generally speaking, on well-managed properties, uh, we want to get away from the whole idea of dosing and moving. And if I put a sheep farmer hat on, an, an alternative to keeping horses stabled, which is what they tend to do in livestock or some forward-thinking farmers are doing in livestock, is to have an area of sacrificial paddock um where you always put your livestock after you've dewormed them and you you just accept that there will be an environmental impact on that small parcel um and you save it for that which then hopefully preserves the biodiversity on the rest of your farm um so that's a strategy that some um, livestock farmers are now using interesting Linda on Facebook's asked, how far can worms and larvae travel, please? And I think the straight answer is we don't know, but it's probably several metres. Could a horse living out and not wormed or tested put in jeopardy the management of a horse in an adjoining paddock? The answer is yes. Um, well, think, yeah, put in jeopardy is probably overstating it. Could it could it could it pick up some parasites and and have a positive worm account? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's going to be at great risk. Right. OK, fine. Brilliant. Um, Leon has asked, Claire, should we be topping our fields? Uh, from a parasite control perspective, um, I don't think there's going to be much impact that I can think of that topping would have. So I think it's much more about the grass ward and the sort of regeneration of that. Rather than parasite control, have you got any thoughts, Dave? Yes. Well, so regenerate again, I'm putting farmer hat on. Um, everyone's talking about regenerative farming more and more and leaving leaving the sward long is supposed to be helpful in parasite control so on that basis topping possibly not the best idea and leon's actually asked a supplementary question about if you take hay from a field which is worm infested or um is that going to create a risk never say never but i wouldn't have thought so i think they'll be desiccated by the time the hay gets eaten I think the only thing that could potentially come in would be tapeworm if there were mites on hay or straw and there's a potential infection, but um, not particularly yeah. for other parasites. So, um, Charlotte, it's an also interesting question here, Clay. Is investment a problem in this field? Should a small research tax be added onto the price of each worm a dose in order to get the veterinary pharmaceutical industry to develop new products? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting one. Certainly one of the feedbacks that's come back is that it's very easy and the wormers are fairly cheap and easy to get hold of um, to give the wormers, which makes a barrier then to the testing element of it. Um, I don't know how you would go about doing that. And I certainly think the pharmaceutical companies would have um, a little bit of something to say about it. But you need to find a motivator that's going to get people over this line of testing without just giving the treatment. So yeah, I think you know it is a good one but I think actually we're coming about it a different way with Canter you know we've got everyone on board everybody including the pharmaceutical companies and um, the researchers to do this and there's going to be some funding being identified we hope that's going to go into more research and help us with this issue so hopefully that's all going to come and roll out. Brilliant Dave Charlotte's asked isn't that no sorry um, 
uh, answer that one. Ask that one. Um, Mel's asked, is there a better time of day to poo pick? <laughs> when it fits into your diary best. Um, no, not really. Just get it done. No. Um, Hats off to the people who do it by head torch. I've heard of that. Oh, God, yes, there's a few people. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. That's, that, that's commitment. Um, d d probably one for Dave. I, re I recently read an article Amanda has asked about red worms and that normal wormers don't target, don't target these, nor does a fecal egg count. Can you advise, advise what does target these and what wormers should be used? I think she's talking about insisted stages of, of red worms rather than the whole parasite life cycle. So the most effective strategy is to have an effective preventative plan, going back to what we started talking about, so that you don't build up large numbers of insisted larvae in the first place, because they are difficult to kill. Um, they Moxidectin is the drug that is most effective against them, but it still doesn't get all of them. And there are question marks over how effectively or otherwise it actually prevents disease associated with insisted larval disease. So prevent it's prevention, prevention, prevention. And that is, that's having a plan that's doing regular fecal worm egg counts and making sure that only limited numbers build up to, to insist. Brilliant. Um, Claire, um, someone on mobile has asked, is there any other user-friendly method that can be used to determine worm eggs beside faecal egg analysis? No, I would say a worm account is really our best bet. You know, it's the best thing we've got currently in doing these regularly to monitor what's going on, evidence-based, and then to um, take action um, depending on your worm egg count results. So I'd say that's your cornerstone. There are obviously other tests available for other parasites, but um, that's the cornerstone really to focus on. Dave, Gabriel has asked, um, or Gabriel has asked, um, and I think possibly from Latin America, but referring to the idea of resting paddock for six months, would you say in um, countries around the equator that mechanical worming control as opposed to chemical worming control could be easier to achieve? Um, obviously in a tropical climate, you, you're going to have to ignore some of what we said, unfortunately. Um, where, where, it's, where it's very dry is going to be very different mechanical as in poo picking or yes i assume so yes so yeah should yeah should be effective yeah. i'm slightly worried i'm not answering that question properly but maybe if she wants to expand offline we can yes okay brilliant yeah so do come back to us on that and we'll, we'll follow up um on education at worldhorsewelfare.org um and tracy has asked claire how long after worming does the wormer continue to be excreted well, it really depends on the actual chemical that's used because um, they're metabolized differently in the body. But the thinking is that if we can restrict grazing diligently for up to sort of nine, 10 days, that that's going to get the majority of that worm are excreted. Uh, we know ivermectin slightly shorter than that. It's more like four or five days till most of that's excreted. Moxidectin, you're going to see that go on slightly longer because of the some of that is then absorbed and um, stored in body fat for to be slow released. But um, to get the majority, we're really looking at the first few days after treatment. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Do you know, I think that's the first ever time I've managed. There were some brilliant questions there, huge, huge array, and we've got through them and we're pretty much on time, which is great. So thank you so much for your, all your questions this evening I, I, or today. I hope they we, we, we've um, I, I personally think Claire and Dave have done a, a brilliant job. Um, so as we sort of begin to look to wrap up, um, Claire, in, we, we, you did a brilliant presentation, lots of thought provoking stuff, lots of great questions. Having heard all that and, and, and presented to that, what are your what, what, what's your take home messages? I think it's really to look at sustainability at face value and in all its merits. So definitely we have to look at the horse health of the future. How do we preserve that? How do we manage this parasite and the resistance issues that we're facing um, to best effect so that we can keep our worm as we do have effective for as long as possible? But also let's not forget the effect that we're having on the environment by putting these chemicals into our horses and really minimize them wherever we can because we need to be really looking after the wider species the environment and um you know our planet for the future so yeah that's my real take home from this brilliant dave 
Um, I totally agree with everything Claire said. And, to, and the best way to make sure that happens is to make sure you have an annual, annually reviewed preventive healthcare plan, not just for parasite control, for other infectious diseases as well, um, but make sure you're planning in advance and you're not just uh, knee jerk thinking, oh, I'm going to do a test, I'm going to do a wormer. You need, a, you need a plan to stick to that needs to be tailored to your property. And if that means you've got to persuade your livery yard owner to get one, then go do it. Yeah. Fighting talk, yeah. Dave. Yeah. It's easy to have here. Uh, well, listen, thank you to Claire and, and Dave. You've been absolutely brilliant. And I think, you know, under the sort of the title of sustainable parasite control, you know, what, what struck me, and I, and I love the you know, thinking about the horse health of the future, um, it's it, it, we do need to make that a bit of an upfront investment. Um, we do need to think about that annual review plan. Sometimes it can feel a bit more difficult. But what we've also heard in the long run you know, it's an absolute win-win-win. We can protect better to make sure the five drugs that we still have that have some effectiveness against worming, we can actually do better to our environment and create a more sustainable equestrian sector, and it can be and will be cheaper. So, you know, on all those levels, it is a win-win-win. So it does sometimes need that just little change in the way we think about it. Um, and there's been so much practical advice that Claire and Dave have given us. So I just want to finish... Um, before I do say thank you to Claire and Dave, just to sort of remind everyone that um, the next um, webinar is on February the 15th, uh, the day after Valentine's, of course, and that's promoting positive equine behaviour and well-being through management. Um, and that's with um, Justine and uh rosa D D justine harrison and rosa vervice uh and and sarah coombs will be in the in the chair for that one so that's great in in a couple of weeks time if you've got any thoughts about future webinars please email us at education at worldhorsewelfare.org a huge thank you to, to to tuning in today and a biggest thank you of all to claire and dave just practical advice practical guidance and things that i think there's many actions that we could all take hold of as, as, as a result of listening Listening to you both so thank you so much for for giving up your time to join us on a world horse welfare wednesday webinar it's great to see you you've done such a good job i'm sure we'll be asking you back very soon thank you very much and good evening thanks thanks really